Congress is trying to spend another $1.7 trillion. The bill is over 4,000 pages long, and I'm gonna read the entire thing to you right here today. The very first thing is 4,000 pages for you. The second is the inflation and deflation. Let's begin. You come to this channel for the real deal. Now I want you to look at the bill. This is the actual thing, the entire thing, over 4,000 pages. Are you ready for me to read each and every word of this bill? That's right. You're gonna fall asleep, so put your head on the pillow and we'll begin right there. No, but seriously, let's look at the details within this bill so that you don't have to fall asleep. And as new information comes out, I'll bring it to you. Right now, I'm going to cover some of the things that have been uncovered already. Let me show you here. You could see part of that. I'll break it down. So you got $1.7 trillion. Okay, that's for the fiscal year 2023. It includes $772 billion for non-defense discretionary programs. Look at this. 858 billion in what they love to call defense funding more than half of the number is for what they call defense funding unbelievable right the bill includes 45 billion dollars in emergency assistance not sure why they call it that to ukraine and our nato allies and 40 billion dollars to assist communities across the country recovering from drought hurricanes, flooding, wildfire, natural disasters, and other matters. So it looks like more money has gone over to Ukraine than to actually help within the country when you look at it like this. $858 billion right there for defense funding in general. That to me is quite extreme. And when you compare that to previous, um, we're supposed to have to think for ourselves and try to make sense of that. Well, we need to have it done. Uh, this is how it works. Or don't worry, uh, you know, you're also getting this. You're also getting that. Well, I'll tell you something. When the government spends this much money, what you get at home is inflation. Inflation hits people not just in the bottom, let's say 20% of income, not the bottom 50% of income. It is now hitting even millionaires. I am showing you this data each and every day, and it's getting quite extreme. I wanted to just break down, looking at it, Congress unveils a sweeping omnibus funding bill with $1.7 trillion price tag. I mean, how did they get away with this? What's important here, by the way, it's specifically 4,155 pages. And the important part is that they want to pass it without delay. So initially, this was supposed to come out at the end of September, I believe, and they couldn't get it done. They couldn't make it happen. All right. Then they said they would do it if after 90 days. They gave themselves 90 days, couldn't do it, and then they gave themselves another week. And now they bring it to the table and they say, you have to pass it right away. We need to go on Christmas vacation. That's literally what they're talking about. Is that okay to pass $1.7 trillion bill that is over 4,000 pages and somehow pass it right away? Do you think there might be some stuff in there that we probably shouldn't need or don't want? I would think so. There's probably at least one or two things, right? Probably a lot more than that. Okay. But of course, if they don't sign it, well, then they're not doing their job. Is that how it works? Well, let's look here. The omnibus is one of the ugliest, least transparent bits of lawmaking I've ever seen, and that's saying something. It isn't just the spending, though the new domestic numbers are gross, given the trillions spent in the past few years. It's also that Congress, in a new trick, is attaching dozens of pieces of standalone legislation to this. Retirement changes, public lands management, healthcare policy, cosmetics regulation, electoral count act changes, horse racing rules, yes I said that, 
Everyone deserves a full debate and a roll call vote so that Americans can see where their representatives stand. Instead, this monstrosity is cooked in the back room and members can claim that they have no choice but to vote against the shutdown, ducking accountability. Not that any members will have time to read this 4,155 pages of bad policy, obscene spending, and self-serving pork and earmarks. They'll just vote and go home for Christmas. Your government at work. GOP and D's are just as bad as each other. And of course, that's what's being said right here because they have commented the fact that, well, you know what? Both sides get what they want in this bill. Therefore, we should pass it. Let it happen. But again, do you not think that there are things inside of this $1.7 trillion bill that might be uh, stuff to watch out for? Well, let's look at some of that. This is Rep. Dan Bishop. My team and I are reading through the omnibus bill today and all $1.7 trillion and 4,155 pages of it. Follow along for some of the most egregious provisions in the bill. It expressly prohibits CBP funding from being used to improve border security. Okay, so that's part of it. Okay, CBP is uh, Customs and Border Protection. Okay, they're saying you can't use that. But what's interesting here, at the same time, it allocates $410 million towards border security for Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt, Tunisia, and Oman. Isn't that weird? Okay, go on. It, this was incredible to me. $1.4 billion for membership in global multilateral organizations, including the UN. $1.4 billion? So when you think the UN is fantastic, the UN is great, you got to understand that you're paying into these organizations. And not a little bit of money, a lot of money. $1.4 billion just from this here. That's one country. Yeah, the US puts in a lot of that, but I think it's huge to say the least. Look, the word salmon, I, I laughed at this one. The word salmon appears 48 times in this bill. So obviously they did a control F on the bill and found that it appears literally 48 times. That's incredible. $65 million for salmon seems fishy. Can you believe this? Look, $3 million for bee friendly highways and another 5 million for the salmon. What's going on here? Unless the other fish feel left out of the spending spree, here's another $65 million for international fisheries commissions. And by the way, I understand that this stuff is important, okay? I'm not trying to say you got to keep the bees alive. You got to make sure that they do what they have to do. You got to look at the fisheries. You got to look at the oceans. You got to look at all these things. I get it. But do you think that this is maybe some of it is wasted money? Look, on a more sinister note, there's at least $575 million for, quote, family planning in areas where population growth threatens biodiversity. Okay. Uh, look at this. $65 million in two programs for Senator Leahy and a federal building named for Nancy Pelosi. They go on. All these, you know, Michelle Obama trail few more earmarks in here, millions here, hundreds of thousands there. You can see it for yourself. There's a lot. $47 billion in Ukraine funding. Is it enough for you? The bill also authorizes Ukraine, Ukrainian Independence Park right here in DC. Monuments for journalists and service animals. It just goes on. Renaming 25 post offices. You just go on and on and on. Okay. Now I've and by the way, the NDAA gets some revisions in it. Love that one. National Defense Authorization Act. You can go on and on in this bill and you could fall asleep. There's a lot in here. And I suggest you take a look through, just flip through random pages. I included all the links in the sources if you want to take a look. But just know that the spending that's taking place is, in fact, going to create more inflation. The pressure that people feel today will be when you look back on it, it will seem like nothing in due time because this keeps getting worse. The budget never gets smaller. It's never cut from here or there where it doesn't really need to be. It's not how it works. It always must expand. And you could agree with it going here and there. It really doesn't matter because they're going to spend it anyway. They're going to sign it. They're going to go home for Christmas and celebrate with their families like everybody wants to do. 
And yet, you are going to pay for it. You're going to pay for it. You are going to pay for it. Secure 2.0 is part of the $1.7 trillion spending bill, putting it on track to usher in retirement system improvements. Secure 2.0 is a collection of provisions intended to build upon the retirement system improvements that were implemented under the Secure Act of 2019. So they want to make sure that people have access to their retirement plans, all this. In the end, the system is not designed to deal with high levels of inflation. Under no circumstances is it able to do so. So regardless of what's being done, it will not help you. And in the end, you will pay more for everything. That's the big deal. That's what we need to understand. And I want to talk to you about that right here and now. Inflation, deflation. What's the story? Well, you could look here that manufacturing, this is, a, this is a opinion article, manufacturing needs federal funding to protect national security and spur innovation boom. And I do agree that we need to have localized manufacturing, food production, everything. And not 100%, it doesn't need to be 100%. That will take a long time and probably will never happen. But when you're talking about building semiconductors, for instance, and you say that, well, we're going to be completely in trouble if we rely on semiconductors coming from one country and then suddenly we're at war. Well, then you've got a big problem. Now, to a certain degree, having interdependence kind of removes the possibility of war. Because they say, well, if we did that, then they'll do this, and then we're basically out of options. So I can see it from that side. Well, if they cut off our semiconductors, we cut off their food supply, and that's war. So you see how it works. I, I get it. But at the same time, you can't just let this happen. You can't just let that slide. You have to have some level of self-sufficiency on an individual level and also on a government level too. 401k's auto enrollment retirement plan lost and found among the secure 2.0 retirement measures. This is part of it. I just want to show that to you. They're doing so many things, putting it into one bill, and it's nothing ever seems to work. Americans' personal saving rate nears an all-time low. Economists explain what it means as potential recession looms. People are going into a recession with the lowest savings ever. What do you think happens? Here you can see on this chart, I hope you can see it there, where we're looking at the lowest rate, like right in this corner over here, it is 2.3, 2.3. Nobody is going to be able to actually deal with a crisis when they have no savings, when their stocks had come down considerably, they put all their money in Tesla, and now what happened? I don't wanna sell now, it's down. Right? What do you do? You have no savings. Well, for some people, they're taking out a home equity line of credit. For other people, they are um, actually going in and using their credit cards. Uh, the buy now, pay later systems, they're being used up like crazy because people do not have the cash on hand. And that tells you what's happening. More spending, more inflation, more money printing. That's the way it goes. And you can look at the indicators, there's many of them. This happens to be just one, FedEx earnings sink as soft demand persists. You could see it with FedEx. I've shown you this before, but you can look at what's happening with actual amount of imports. Look at Target, look at Walmart, look at all the other businesses that I've shown you, whereby they have way, Lululemon was another one, um, where they have way too much inventory. And so they say, okay, we're gonna have to, get rid of that inventory, sell it at a discount, liquidate it because we're moving into a new season. So we need to get rid of it fast. That means cheaper prices. That means less profits. That means earnings are down. And so the companies are suffering. Companies suffer. They lay people off. Not good, right? No, not good. Facing recession and political pressure, the Fed will move the inflation goalposts. So this is the way it goes. They've got the uh, terminal rate, which is the highest level that they will allow the Fed funds rate to get to 5%. They let it get to 5%. Then what? They start cutting that down? Well, it depends. Depends on inflation. So if inflation starts to come down, but let's say it just won't go down further than 4% or it won't go down further than 3%, they might say, that's good enough. And then they start to cut interest rates slowly. 
That's the intention. That's the idea. But if we get some massive squash down in demand, like nobody's spending any money, nobody's going to the restaurants, the movie theaters, and so on, well, then inflation does come down on its own in that way. But some of these things, like your rent and you know, power, food, they may not change the way that they want it to, and that's called being sticky. Okay? Economists place 70% chance of U.S. recession in 2023. I can't tell you what's going to happen, but I could certainly say the way it's going, things are looking real ugly right now. High government deficits can lead to an unsustainable debt burden, which can lead to higher taxes, a decrease in private investment, and a decrease in economic growth. Inflation is experienced as an increase in the general level of prices of goods and services. Rising inflation decreases the purchasing power of money, leading to higher costs of living and reduced consumption. High interest rates can make it more difficult for businesses and households to service their debts, leading to defaults, bankruptcies, and further economic contraction. When the government spending and debt are extremely large, it can lead to economic stagnation. Large government deficits can crowd out private investment and lead to higher taxes to pay for government spending, both of which can lead to decreased economic growth. Additionally, when government spending and debt are extremely large, it can lead to a situation where the government is unable to repay its debt, leading to a sovereign debt crisis. An example of this can be seen in Greece in 2010. Greece had high government deficits and debt, and an inability to borrow more led to a sovereign debt crisis. This led to drastic austerity measures, a decrease in economic growth, and a decrease in the purchasing power of money. The situation eventually led to a deep recession and a long period of economic stagnation. That's what we could be facing today. It doesn't matter if you're in the United States or maybe somewhere else in the world. The truth of the matter is that when you do these things, they have this reverberation. And it doesn't necessarily uh, get felt right away. It might be a period of time later. So I break this down to you. We will see what happens. I want to know what you think in the comments below. You got to tell me what you think and what others think, and we can share this information. Don't forget to hit that subscribe. It's right next to the the like button. Hit that subscribe and I'll bring you more information tomorrow. Take care.